planes. Nothing was spared. All for the ultimate victory. But among all of this chaos and tragedy, something happened that made our understanding of our own atmosphere much better. It was an incident that happened with American bomber jets that flew from the US to Japan. While the jets were traveling from east to west, that is, starting from the US and going towards Japan, these jets observed a significant reduction in their speeds. On the other hand, while coming back to the US from Japan, that is, from west to east, they used to witness an increase in their speeds. After careful study of this phenomena, it was found that there was a strong air circulation from west to east in the upper portion of troposphere, which obstructed the free movement of these jet fighters. This strong air circulation was later named as jet streams. So, what are these jet streams? How are they formed? Where are they located? And how do they affect the overall atmospheric circulation around the whole globe? Let's start by defining what a jet stream is. So jet streams are fast moving winds that circulate high up in the atmosphere. Now from this definition, we get two pieces of information. One is that these are fast flowing winds. And the other piece of information is that they are located high in the atmosphere. Okay, so how high? Well, the height ranges somewhere between 8 to 15 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. We can say that it is around the region of upper troposphere in itself. And yes, this is almost the same height at which most of the aeroplanes fly. Now, the reason for these winds having very high speeds can be explained by their location in the upper troposphere. How is that? Well, these winds, they blow at a higher level. The winds that flow close to the surface of the Earth, they experience a lot of frictional drag, especially in areas with physical features such as hills, mountains, trees, forests, and so on. All these, they hamper the wind speed in itself. At the same time, the upper troposphere has relatively low frictional drag, and hence, the winds attain very high speeds. Just to give you some numbers, the speed of the jet streams vary between 129 and 225 kilometers per hour. And in some cases, the speeds can reach even up to 443 kilometers per hour. One way to visualize these jet streams is to consider them as rivers. River currents are generally the strongest in the center and decrease in strength as one approaches the river banks. This applies to jet streams as well. The speed of a jet stream is maximum at the center and it reduces as we move towards or approach the edges. So we can consider these jet streams as rivers of air. Now we can notice another feature of jet streams from the story we saw earlier. Can you guess it? It is the direction. The planes felt an increase in their speeds when traveling from west to east. That is, from Japan to the US. Thus, the jet streams were aiding the planes. Thus, it is clear from the above example that the direction of the jet streams 
is from west to east. So now we know three things about jet streams. They are fast, they flow in the upper troposphere and they flow from west to east. Are you curious to know if all jet streams are the same or if there are different types? Well, there are two different types of jet streams. The permanent jet streams and the temporary jet streams. Permanent jet streams are those which exist throughout the year, while temporary jet streams are formed in a specific location for a limited period of time. Since they are not present throughout the year, they are called as temporary jet streams. Now, coming to the permanent jet streams, there are two major examples in this category. The subtropical westerly jet streams and polar front jet streams. While under temporary jet streams, we have the examples of the tropical easterly jet stream and the Somali jet stream. Okay, so that was all about the different types of jet streams. Now, let's discuss the formation of jet streams. Well, before we dive into that part, there are a few concepts that we need to revisit. First, we will look into the concept of the tricellular model of atmospheric circulation. Do you remember the Hadley cell, the Ferrell cell and the polar cell? This model explains the general atmospheric circulation of the winds across the globe. The second concept we need to revise is the concept of geostrophic winds which result from the interplay of pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. Now let us understand this with an example. As we know, wind moves when there is a pressure gradient. Let us suppose that these isobars represent different values of pressure present in any area. As you can see, down south, we have a high pressure of around 5 bar. And as we move north, it decreases to 4, 3, 2 and finally 1 bar. Now because of this pressure difference, a pressure gradient force develops from high pressure to low pressure. And thus, the wind starts moving from south to north. Now let's bring in another factor in the system, the Coriolis force. We know it is an apparent force that as a result of Earth's rotation, which deflects moving objects to the right in Northern Hemisphere and to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. Let us assume our system is in Northern Hemisphere. So, the Coriolis force will turn the winds towards its right. As the wind speed increases, the effect of Coriolis force increases as well. And there comes a point when the pressure gradient force gets balanced by the Coriolis force and the resultant direction of the winds become almost parallel to the isobars. These winds are called as geostrophic winds. Now with the help of these two concepts, we can understand the origin of jet streams. The jet streams form when warm air mass meets cold air mass in the upper troposphere. We know the air above tropical region is warm, while the air above temperate region is relatively cold. Now imagine two air columns in these two different regions. These two columns of air apply the same pressure on the surface of the Earth. Let us say hypothetically, it's around 10 bars each. Now we know that cold air is comparatively denser. 
Thus, a smaller column of cold air can apply the same pressure as a relatively larger column of warm air. Let us assume the height of the warm air column is around 10 units and the height of the cold air column is somewhere around 5 units. Now the fall of pressure in the cold air column will be comparatively faster when compared to the warm air column. Are you confused? Okay, let us try to understand it in this way. Let us assume the rate of fall in the pressure is uniform in both these cases. So, for a warm column of air, the rate of fall in pressure with respect to height will be somewhat like this. And for cold air column, it will be somewhat like this. Here, you can see that warm air has a generous 10 units of height to achieve a fall of 10 bars of pressure. While the cold air column has to achieve the same fall within a mere 5 units of height. And thus, the fall in this case shall be considerably faster. Now let us take a specific height, say 3 units, from the surface of the Earth itself. Note the pressure values for both these columns. 7 bar for warm and 4 bar for cold. So what will be the pressure gradient? And in which direction will the wind actually flow? Well, it will flow from the warm air column towards the cold air column. Something similar happens in the upper reaches of troposphere as well. If we assume we are in the northern hemisphere, then a high pressure will develop in the warm air mass of the tropical regions. And simultaneously, a low pressure will develop in the cold air mass of the temperate regions. Thus, the flow of the wind shall be from south to north. Now, as the air moves, the Coriolis force continues to act on it and it deflects the wind towards the right. As the wind speed continues to increase, the effect of Coriolis force increases as well. And there comes a point when the pressure gradient force gets balanced by the Coriolis force and the resultant direction is from west to east. Now something similar happens in higher latitudes as well. When the cold air mass from polar region interacts with relatively warm air mass from the temperate regions, we get a jet stream again. Thus, we saw two jet streams form in the northern hemisphere. While the first one is called the subtropical westerly jet stream, it is formed around 30 degree latitude at the boundary of interaction between the Hadley and the Ferrell cells. The other one is called as the polar front jet stream. It is formed somewhere around 60 degree latitude at the boundary of the Ferrell and the polar cells. Now in the southern hemisphere, we can see two similar jet streams. The Hadley, Ferrell, Polar Cells and the Pressure Bells are permanent. Since the jet streams are formed due to interaction of these cells, they are permanent as well. In other words, the jet streams are present throughout the year.